When we talk about quantum physics, we often encounter the term entanglement. You might have heard that it allows spooky action at a distance, that it s the basis for quantum computing, or that it s needed to understand how single molecules can exhibit stable structures. I don't want to tell you here why entanglement is so important. Maybe you know already. But I'd like to tell you about an experiment that claims to show entanglement-like effects without actually having entanglement. Does that make sense? Well, not really. But let's have a look. This video comes with a quiz that lets you check how much you remember. First, a quick recap. What is entanglement? It's what happens when two or more quantum. Particles interact with each other in such a way that their properties become correlated. If you want to know more about what that means, you should definitely check out my earlier video about the double slit experiment. In the meantime, let me briefly explain Bell tests. They are experiments that test whether nature has certain correlations that we expect from quantum physics. The key idea is that these correlations can be destroyed by local realism. This means if you think that quantum physics is wrong in nature, actually has hidden variables that determine the outcome of measurements, then those correlations must be destroyed. The most basic Bell test is with two parties, Alice and Bob, who each get one of two possible measurement outcomes. Often these are spin-up or spin-down states, but it could also be any other pair of measurement outcomes. In a famous paper from 1964, John Bell derived an inequality that puts a limit on what the combined probability of getting certain. Joint measurement outcomes can be if local realism is correct. That's because if it were true, then the correlations could be destroyed by local communication. Bell's inequality tells you how much the individual probabilities can vary independently. For example, whether Alice gets a zero or a one shouldn't depend on what Bob gets. So these probabilities can't all be totally uncorrelated. If you actually do the experiment, though, you find that the quantum correlations can't be explained by local realism. They violate Bell's inequality. And that's why you always hear people say that Bell tests confirmed quantum mechanics. But there's a problem with this argument. It's that these experiments are really difficult to do with real physical systems. That's because if you have a real physical system, you need to measure it, and that inevitably disturbs the system. Ass. Many of these tests instead use single photons and exploit the fact that we can calculate what state they db in if no measurement had been done. Then it's not the actual measurement result that's compared with predictions, but a reconstruction of it. This works because the disturbance caused by the measurement is known and can be calculated. But if you use single photons, you run into a different problem. The light sources you actually have are never truly single photon sources. They have some small, but usually not negligible probability to emit two or more photons. Oh. This makes the analysis more complicated and the results less clear. It's all this background that makes the new paper so interesting. The authors have managed to do a Bell test with four photon emitters, which is unprecedented. But that's not all. They say that while the photons came from four different sources, experimental results can't be distinguished from the case that they came from a single source. Let me try to explain what this means. You see, each of the four emitters has two possible states. Either it emitted a photon, or it didn't. If we combine the results of two emitters, we get four possible combinations, 0, 0, 0, 1, 10, 11. Here, 0 and 1 mean that the emitter didn't emit a photon, or that it did. Now, if these four emitters were all one device, then you'd have 16 possible combinations. But the authors claim that their experimental results coup and be distinguished from the case that the photons came from a single source. This would then be 16 minus 4 equals 12 indistinguishable combinations. But wait, isn't that impossible? How can you have more indistinguishable cases than if they actually came from the same source? The resolution of this apparent contradiction is that it isn't the actual individual emissions that are compared, but the measurement outcomes, see? The detectors that measure whether a photon arrived or not have some small error. They don't always tell the truth. So you can't just compare the measurement results with the expectation for a single source. Instead, you have to compare how often the detectors agree with each other. And what they found is that the agreement is way larger than can be explained by any classical model. It's even more than what you'd expect for a single source seems to require entanglement, or does it? Yes, indeed. This sounds pretty crazy. 
But the authors say that this unexpected correlation can be explained by what they call quantum indistinguishability. To understand what this means, consider a slightly simpler scenario with only two emitters. Now the question is, why the detector clicks sometimes when no photon was emitted? This can happen because a photon from one source hit the detector of the other source. These are the black and orange lines. This is normally what you'd compare with a single source. However, if you take a closer look, you'll notice that there are additional coincidences that are not due to a photon hitting the other detector. These are the gray lines. Those additional coincidences are what the authors call quantum indistinguishable. The reason that they are indistinguishable is that you co measure which of the two sources a photon came from. You only measure that a photon arrived, so the data that you actually have is this table where the columns are the measurement. Results of the detectors in the rows are the different possible source configurations. Example, the first row means that the first source emitted a photon and the second didn't. But the issue is now that you QAN tell this apart from the situation where the second source emitted a photon and the first didn't. The statistics of these events is the same. This is the quantum indistinguishability. Now in general, you can't calculate the contributions of each of these rows to the overall coincidence count. But if the error of the detectors is small, then you can approximate that. The indistinguishable contributions come from the off-diagonal terms. The surprising thing is now that this contribution can be much larger than for a single source. So what does this all mean? Does this experiment break quantum physics? No, it doesn't. It just shows that the standard definitions of what we call entangled and what we call separable states are somewhat ill-suited for describing what happens in realistic experiments. I believe this is going to be the start of a lively discussion and probably also some follow-up experiments. Personally, I think this paper is very interesting because I believe that the concept of quantum indistinguishability is going to play an increasingly important role. This is because it's related to the question which quantum properties can be used for what we loosely call quantum computing. Those that can be used are called quantum information. There's an ongoing debate about which parts of quantum physics are quantum information. But I think we all agree that if you can't tell apart quantum states, they won't be useful for computation. So maybe this experiment isn't a revolution, but it might be a step on the way to finding out what's really relevant for quantum information. Maybe one day we all find that quantum indistinguishability is the key to solving the problem that quantum computers are so fragile. But until then, I'm sure we'll see lots of papers about it. The topic of this paper is quite advanced, so let's see how well you understood it by trying to answer these questions. Send your answers to the email provided. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.